As of the summer of 2022, filmmaker Tanada Yuki has made a dozen feature-length films and has directed several high-profile television series. In addition to filmmaking, she is also a screenwriter, and she wrote the scripts for many of her films as well as for her colleagues. Tanada is the author of several novels, most of which she has adapted to film. In this interview, film scholar Alejandra Amendiris Hernandez discusses the career of Tanada and helps us to understand the perspective Tanada brings to cinema, particularly in her depictions of characters and on-screen relationships that are often unexplored in mainstream film. Armendiris Hernandez is a PhD candidate at the University Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, Spain, writing a dissertation on female authorship and representation in the films directed by Tanaka Kinuyo. She has been a visiting researcher at the Meiji Gakuin University in Tokyo, Japan, and Birkbeck University of London in the UK. Her research, teaching, and publications include the study of women filmmakers in Japan, gender representations in East Asian culture, and transnational film connections between Japan and Latin America. Alejandra, it is so nice to see you today. Hello, welcome after all these years. Thank you for for joining me to talk about the director Tanada Yuki and your work on Tanada Yuki. So to begin with, I would love it if you would just give us a little bit of background on Tanada, um, who she is and what her career has looked like, what kind of media industries she's working in. So, Tanada is one of these uh, new young female directors that emerged in Japanese cinema around the 2000, so in the new century. Um, Is not the only one, and I talk about a group because there are a group of of women who were born in the late uh, 70s or the 70s in general, so in the 2000s they will be around 25 years old. So they started doing films and Tanaka, Tanada was one of them. She, she was born actually in the 75. She's from a small industrial town in the south of Japan called Kitakyushu in mm-hmm. Fukuoka Prefecture. And uh, she lives there and went to high school there and, and uh, spent her life until she moved to Tokyo in uh, when she was around 20 years old, as far as mm-hmm. I know. And that should be around 1995, so the late 80s. Mm-hmm. She in, initially, she doesn't have a special in, she didn't have a special interest in film. She, she started studying theater. Uh, so when she came to to Tokyo, she was more focusing on maybe wo- working part time and, and watching stage, stage production. Mm. But then she started realizing the images and, and visual images like television or cinema could help her as well, like as a way of self expression. So she decided to study some techniques because she is not, oh, according to the interview, she is not a cinephile that has been growing up watching many films or. Mm-hmm having authors to follow or, or, or this kind of profile. So mm-hmm. she discovered, for, according to her, to her interviews, she discovered cinema much later. And she decided to study in Image Forum. That is a very famous school, but also film theater, cinematech, uh, publishing house in Tokyo. Image Forum is mainly known for her, their experimental their interest in experimental filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So they created the school with the idea of training new filmmakers in different ways of making film. Even if this is very interesting regarding how how Tanada became a filmmaker, she Mm -hmm. also said in in her interviews that the the main reason to to join Image Forum was actually the the school was the cheapest one. For her, yeah. actually, was the idea that she could keep working as part time and going to school and paying a reasonable fee, so mm-hmm. she didn't have to, you know, ask for a loan or anything else. Like if if she goes to if she went to a maybe university film schools or or more prestigious film school, they were mm-hmm. much more expensive. So mm-hmm. she didn't have that choice, according to her. So she decides to go for Image Forum. So she get there, they say, the training of how is to be a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And after, apparently, she didn't work very much in film until it was the moment at the end, you know, of, on the late 90s, early 2000s, where independent filmmaking, because there were like video cameras mm-hmm. and digital cameras, and they were kind of a 
emergence of people doing independent filmmakers self-produce outside of the traditional studio system that was mm -hmm. already gone by the time, of course, but uh, also outside of the kind of big production. It was almost kind of amateur filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And she did one film that is called Moru, presented the film to the Pia Film Festival. There was mm -hmm. one of the venues uh, where... Again, Jishu, Ega filmmaking, so mm -hmm. like film made, self-produced independently by the own filmmaker in a, in a kind of amateur way, were, were presented. Mm -hmm. and, and she won. She won yes. the Grand Prix and, and that opened to her and, and a range of possibilities and she continued to work in, in, in films, starting from there. After there, she presented that the Moru was a, a middle middle film. It was not a long film, but right. uh, after there, she started making feature films. Um, mm -hmm. First a commentary, but then all has been doing feature films. Different genres, different type of more independent, more commercial films. She has done, as far as I know now, around 11 films. Yeah, yeah. Like theatrically released. Um, and then in the recent years, she has done a lot of also television. Mm -hmm. so she has done television series. In all of these, both television and film, she often writes the scripts. So she, we can see her as a kind of uh, script writer and, and director, not yeah. only directing film. And also yeah. she has been um, publishing novels, some of them related with their films, some of them uh, that then she adapted as a film. So basically she has also a strong writer uh, profile on top mm -hmm. of, of uh, film director. She has received different prizes along her career. One of the most important and maybe became important because give her visibility inside and outside Japan was the Directors Guild of Japan as newcomer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she won it, I think, in 2009, if I correct. Mm -hmm. And that clearly uh, gave her a, a kind of auteur uh, yes. start in, in the industry yes. and opened yeah. her probably many doors to, to meet more people in the commercial and mainstream industry in Japan. She continues to do films uh, today, and that's a, a very good sign because some of the filmmakers who emerged with them, or with her in the early 2000s, have disappeared or, yeah. or not making many films, but she still continues, and her next film should be in release, I think, in autumn this year. Yeah, my brother, yeah. Mariko. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see it. I mean, what a, you've covered so much ground. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I think what's so interesting about Tanada, just from her background, is that she's she sort of hits all of these marks that a lot of her contemporaries share in common. So something like image form as a as a place of training. Although I'd never heard that it was because it was cheap, and that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle there. But image forum uh, debuting at Pia Film Festival that's so important for this collective of, of uh, women directors, and then at getting accolades and prizes and moving forward with experimental cinema into commercial cinema. So Tanana is a really good person for us to um, to, to see the broad spectrum of, of maybe how this works to, to be able to make it in commercial Japanese cinema. Um, so you've talked about her early work, Moru, uh, which was this mid-length film, but then after that, of course, she starts making these feature-length films. So can you introduce us to some of these early works that she's done? I know you've written on Tsukito Cherry, um, but what are some themes or ideas that appear maybe early on in Tanada's work, and, and do they continue, I suppose, is also part of the question. Mm -hmm. I think that in Moru, you can see already even if it's very um, beginner film, I don't know if we can call it like that, but uh, there is a quite open depiction of female everyday life. Most of the films made by, by Tanada are, uh, the protagonists are women. Not all of them. They are also very interesting male characters, and maybe we can discuss about that later. But clearly mm. the presence of women is quite important, I think, in, in her cinema. Most even if not all, again, of her films are also adapted for manga or novels uh, written by uh, women that clearly has the focus, the narrative on, on the women's experiences. So that, even if she has been quite, we can say, outspoken about not being considered a woman director or a female director making women films, 
Mm -hmm. is still a presence in her cinema and um, and perhaps because the she arrived at a time when those type of topics in a way became more popular maybe she has taken advantage of that and making uh, and mm -hmm. being able to keep making films because there is an interest in in, in watching uh, women's stories on the screen but I think that one of, of apart from the depiction of female experience uh, she also was particularly known at the beginning. And I think that this has been a constant in her career, maybe because, again, it fits the idea of having a different perspective in films, mm -hmm. is the depiction of sexuality. It's not only related to female sexuality, but of course, because many of her protagonists are, fem are women, is of course a representation of sexuality uh, most of the time from a female perspective, if we can call it in that way. In uh, Moon and Cherry, the protagonist is a male character, mm -hmm. but the idea of the film is basically an assertive female character using sexuality and looking for sexual for, for sexual encounters with this protagonist. Yes. So having a, a kind of an active role. Beyond this kind of dichotomy between active and passive, I think in, in Tanada's career and in her films, you can see the sex and how sex is embedded in everyday life of people and how mm. it's a way of expression for people, both of, of uh, happiness and, and pleasure, but also of more disturbing and more uh, traumatic experiences that get canalized through sex. In her films, I think that you can find often this idea of the depiction of sexuality and, and sexual practices, a different type of sexual practices, maybe even beyond the mainstream sex depiction in commercial cinema. You can, you can find that, for example, in, uh, I mean, Sakuran, she did, uh, is a film by Ninagawa Mika, uh, directed by Ninagawa Mika, but uh, Tanada Yuki wrote the script, an adaptation of a manga written by a woman, and that was focusing on the story of uh, Oiran prostitute in Edo period, uh, in which, of course, sex is part of the everyday life of the protagonist, for good and bad. But also we have, like, for example, the last uh, one of the last films that she has done uh, called Romance Doll that uh, you can all watch in Netflix at the moment. She mm. did it in 2019 and it was based on a novel that she wrote 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that film, again, we have a protagonist uh, that actually in a very normal setting of a marriage with the problems and, and with the the. the side story of the husband being sex doll um, mm. craftsman, but in, in which she enjoys sex, want to have sex with her husband, say, I want to have sex with her, with, with you, and they enjoy each other. And, and Tanada depicts that in a very honest way, in mm. a very everyday life way. And it's not a feel about sex. Like it can be, for example, more Moon and Cherry that is more focused on this idea of of the sexual um, mm -hmm. relation between, between each other is much more an adult film in the sense adult in the sense that is the protagonists are middle-aged uh, marriage couple they are not yeah. younger students as you can see in uh, the Cold War look at the sky but another of her films in which there yeah. is the sexual discovery of sex when when they are teenagers and the coward uh, this, uh, this is another film in which again there is a sexual relation in the context of cosplay sex so there is this kind of uh, depiction even if i don't think that we can consider her like a, a director of erotic films or a particularly focus on sex but there is always sex as part of the relationship between the characters. So that I think that is one feature that we can see in different films along her uh, filmography. Another thing that may be interesting to, to notice about her films is also this idea that the characters often are... Um, I think that we can find two, like two types of films in, in, in Tanada's uh, filmography. Some of them are more commercial and are more... We have characters set... In, in a more mainstream environment, like, mm. like for example, Round Trip Heart in, in mm -hmm. all in Japanese romance, in the, in the protagonist is, is an attendance in a train. Uh, we have other uh, films in which there is, like even Roman Dons, they are a regular couple uh, mm -hmm. 
living a very normal marriage uh, in, in contemporary Japan. But we mm -hmm. also have another type of film in, in Canada. There are characters that are a bit different. Even yes. if they are not <laughs> outsiders, they, even yes. if they, are, they are inside of the society, but they, by choice or by force, they have something that makes them or they set them apart for the regular average Japanese uh, society, both in, in terms of maybe their, their jobs or maybe their way of life mm -hmm. or maybe their the private life. For example, we have in one million yen uh, girl, the protagonist is a young girl, a, a not young woman, I would say, that actually uh, has been in jail. So she left jail, uh, she finished her sentence and then start uh, the life. But also we have in, for example, one of her more recent films, My Dad and Mr. Ito, in which the, there is a couple 20 years difference of age. So she mm -hmm. is 30 uh, something, still mm -hmm. working part time without many ambition or aspirations of mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the ideal middle class uh, or the middle class ideal in Japanese society, who is living with this guy 20 years older than her. Again, without any interest in becoming part of the mainstream society and the mainstream life of middle class in Japan. So we have, again, in the cohort who look at the sky, something that appears very normal or very regular uh, in the sense that she, she, one of the protagonists is married and housewife and her husband mm -hmm. works outside, but then we discover that she has a, a sexual relationship with a teenager uh, in which they play cosplay sex, so they they, mm -hmm. they use costumes of the main character that they like, and they have sex uh, playing those characters. And then we also have the point that she is struggling to have children with her husband, so the issue of fertility. So there is something always that even if it looks like a, like a regular character, we see there are something that is they set them apart <laughs> from the yeah. mainstream mainstream average and that is not only in terms of what they are but also how they are represented by Tanada because mm. it's kind of it's not only that they are the characters and that does so in a part-time job instead of a full-time or they are they should be a, a housewife if they are not but it's also the way that Tanada represented us also part of the Japanese society mm. so not being judged as being outsiders or she doesn't frame them as outsiders and paying a price of being outsiders. Right, or right. Being, So she, I think, show them as people who live those lives in, in contemporary Japan mm -hmm. with their problems or not their problems, but not as opposed as the middle class ideal uh, right. that you often see in, in, in other films in, in Japan. She doesn't, she doesn't like try to redeem them in any way to try and normalize no. them back into the fold, right? She just sort of lets yeah. them have their lives, um, yeah. even at the close of her films. I like what you said very much about um, her depictions being not just everyday, but also honest and direct. Um, I don't think she shies away through through too much metaphor or anything. She just really is, is in your face. And I'm thinking about the opening scene to Moru, I think it is, where there's a young man who's, a, who's about to take his life at the top of the building and the young woman runs up the stairs and you think she's going to say, you know, don't don't stop, you have so much to live for. But then she she sort of berates him and says, you think your life is dead, you've never had a period, you know, and so she just brings it in, right to the right, right away, the, the, the sort of female experience or um, the sexuality is also right in the front too um, in Moon and Cherry. So I, yeah, I like the way that you put that. It's very honest and direct. So you've talked about these, these, themes and these ideas um, that she brings to it. And I think a lot of this is some things that we don't see a lot in contemporary film, particularly sort of representing the underdog or the outsider, but giving them the full experience and not being judgmental about that in any way. Can you also describe her filmmaking style as well, in addition hmm. to the things that, yeah. I think that she, in this filmmaking, she always, in the interviews that I, I have read about her, she doesn't seem to be very interested in having a style, in a way, uh -huh. okay? in, in having a, um, a mark of her presence behind the camera. So I think that you can see in, in the films. I think that for me, I think that she is very good at, uh, at framing the characters, uh, especially when, when they are, for example, these scenes of sex in which they are quite made and quite um, difficult to don't become exploitative for of the 
characters of, of the moment. And, and she filmed those scenes with a very, I, I don't know if you can call it minimalist style, but a very calm pace, uh, mm-hmm. even with one camera. And I, I remember, it came to my mind some of the scene at the beginning of the cohort who look at the sky, mm-hmm. in which there is the first encounter in which they are played. And it's kind of, even if they, they are, you know, cosplaying, that is very excessive and, and exaggerated in mm-hmm. a way, the way in which she moves around the characters where they are having sex is kind of natural in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that she likes very much or I don't feel that in her films you can find a very um, melodramatic style of filmmaking in the sense that I, I she doesn't use many like close-up or there are some in, in, in Moru at the beginning, maybe in, in Moon and Cherry, you have some cutting very aggressive or very even, even I would say, manga-esque uh, mm-hmm. cutting, like to making a point and, and having some kind of emotional impact. But in general, I find that as long as she continued to her career, her style of filmmaking became much more quiet and calm and, and even invisible in a way um Mm -hmm. i don't think that you see much her having a um, making a stance with the camera movement or making a stance with the framing in general i think that she likes or or she she shoot their characters in a very middle way so not Mm -hmm. a very close up but not even like, you know, in the middle of nowhere as a small characters in a landscape. So she Mm -hmm. has a very classic, if we can call it, way of filmmaking, like Mm -hmm. uh, middle shots and and, and characters placed in a surrounding, but there is not much loss in that surrounding. You have always the character always there in in, Mm -hmm. in, in a middle length, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I think that in general, I would say that she's quite, minimalist in her filmmaking trying to avoid melodramatic or Mm. like sentimentality in the filmmaking and in the stories that she writes i think that that's that's the fact that she wrote the script of many films that she directed connect these things i think that also at the script level she avoid sentimentality and 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 too much Mm. emotion in, in the characters and that translate after in the filmmaking I think. Do you, do you think that by bringing the camera back and maybe having that just sort of the space to focus on the characters but not you know get in their face with too many close-ups not too many dramatic cuts the sort of you know more calm pacing is that what gives us perhaps that sense of the everyday of the the kind of <laughs> sort of more like banal stories or ter- or just like these are just people living their lives is that does that contribute to it, the way that she's set up the camera? Not in your face, but more invisible. Um, I think that, that, that you are correct, yeah. I think that that uh, definitely helps to make you feel as as audience, like if you were, you know, passing, walking on a street in any city uh, in Japan and seeing the scene that is happening in the field, but seeing there, like, like you will see it from, you know, across the street or something mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. I, I have that feeling when I see her films that I, I just, I can imagine myself walking through a street in, in Japan and seeing the characters doing whatever they are doing in that scene and just and me passing by looking at them. It, it produced that sense of, of everyday life in, in, in me when I see the films and, and the filmmaking style. Does that feel different to you than, than maybe some other films that are coming out of Japan right now? So, so there's been a lot of manga influence, you know, and anime mm-hmm. influence, so that it's created really dramatic um, sort of over-the-top experiences in some of the bigger commercial films. But then you know, there's a lot of films in the world that'll take you into the interior of people's houses that are experiences that would be shut away. So this seems to be different to me. Does that seem different to you from that, that maybe what she's bringing to commercial cinema that we're not seeing elsewhere? I think that it, that it is. You can't, because you can see the everyday life of the characters also shown in a way that you can relate uh, with your own everyday life. So you mm. see them doing things that you do and even if they are, you know, manual task uh, at home, you see their homes, but you also see them moving around and going here and there. And I think that if you compare with other, I mean, especially, for example, her films, some of them are based on manga and based mm-hmm. on, so manga has this clearly a very particular language and, and aesthetics. And, and mm-hmm. sometimes it may be 
obvious the idea that when you adapt a manga, you feel or use that aesthetics and the language in films because you can do it, right? You can you can mm-hmm. have a manga esque film if you like, and mm-hmm. I don't think that Canada does it. That I think that she changed a little bit this idea of of the rhythm and the pace or or the montage of the of the editing as well the man- in manga in films you cannot mm-hmm. find that there and maybe also the fact that most of, of or some of her films has been adapted from novels give her um because manga you have the visual element right that yes. you can yes. uh, the, the, it's a storyboard yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a storyboard right yeah. in novels you don't in novels you have uh, your imagination and she used the imagination to adapt the novel and to direct it yeah. So clearly that gives her a much more freedom, probably if adapting novels than manga, I will say. Mm-hmm. But I feel that even in the manga adaptation, she goes away a little bit from the manga language. Interesting. So we've already touched on a couple of genres that she works in. And you said she has this wide spectrum of, of genres. So we have the rom-com, we have mel- a little bit of melodrama, even though it's pulled mm-hmm. back, some comedies, and then also pink film, as you've mentioned. And she gets a lot of attention for the pink film and the depiction of sexuality. And so I'm sort of ask you a question, not necessarily about Tonata so much, but about the perception of Tanada and how she is received. So mm. why is it that even though her films run a spectrum, she really gets a lot of attention for the pink films in particular? What is going on with that attention? I think that one of, of the things is, of course, that because she's a woman and you don't find often women directors, particularly in Japan, depicting sex in such an open way, in a straight mm-hmm. way. Also, because I think that even Japanese cinema in general, beyond the director, the gender of the directors, yeah. in the case of uh, Tanada as well, apart from the fact that she is a woman directing films in which sex has an important role, even if it's not, they are not films about sex, but it's, it's depicted very openly, is the fact that in general, she all, all, all sometimes focus on, on young characters and, you know, um, both. If you think about it, even like when it's teenagers who discover sex or people at the first experience, sexual experiences, mm-hmm. or they are more adult characters experiencing sex in a different way, you don't find often this uh, straight and open depiction of sexuality in Japanese cinema, contemporary Japanese yeah. cinema, Main, m- male director or female director. So I think that that's clearly... M- set her apart in terms of how she's able to do that. Maybe as well because, because she's been able to do it in a very natural way, she has been proposed projects that involve that. And that clearly ah. constructs a profile on, on her career. Uh-huh. And of course, I think that another question, especially if we think about it from the point of view of the West, is sexualization of Japan. So the idea that... Uh, Films that have sex or uh, violence or, you know, extreme um, depiction of Japanese society sell better in the, in, in, in the West. I don't know if Anada fit that bill in terms of, because I feel that she, clearly at the beginning with Moon and Cherry, she got picked up because of that probably topic, that having a, a very weird sex comedy there was not it was very fresh i think that if you think about it of the of the films in which they are you know sexual or or romantic relationship often in japan sometimes they are very silly and very yeah. naive and very mm-hmm. getting married is the only thing important right and and, and right. i think that Anata goes way beyond that she does yeah. she's not interested in the project that she has done even if it touched those topics, because maybe for, you know, it's, it's a topic, especially for women, it's still important in Japan, Japanese society. It doesn't focus on that. It's, it doesn't represent that. It's, it's mm-hmm. not the interest of the films. So I think if you compare those films that maybe arrive to the West in a very, they seem, for me, they seem all the same. Uh, uh-huh. in, in one of Tanada, uh, Tanada's films, you feel... A, freshness that uh, you can find in them yeah so maybe it's a bit of both maybe it's this kind of uh, refreshing depiction of characters having sex or having fights or having whatever in a regular yeah. way in a way and the fact that it's also 
appealing for certain audience in the West having a woman dealing with sex in Japan. That in a way orient orientalize Japanese women even more. <laughs> if they, if they are <laughs> yes. And so the plot of, of Moon and Cherry, right, is that there's college students who are part of an erotic literature club, right? Yes. And they're, and so the, the um, head of the club actually is a young woman, which is very surprising to the, the new entry, the, the young man who, um, for whatever reasons, has decided to join this erotic literature club and she exploits this young man in a series of, of escapades that um don't feel romantic really right and they are some of them are a little traumatic for this young man right so um i agree it felt it feels really um different and refreshing and not silly at all so i'm wondering then if in her both domestic and internationally you've sort of set up these different expectations of, of Tanada's works that are linked but different when we think about Orientalism and the West reception of Japanese cinema and the eroticization of Japanese women. Does that set up expectations within Japan for, for what Tanada is going to do? You said this might have um, an impact on the types of projects that are proposed to her. But also, have you noticed on the festival circuit, are there some films that have been picked up by Tanada and others that have been uh, maybe left behind that are, that are part of this picture? Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah, you are right. This, uh, I don't know exactly how much she, because I feel that in a way she has now a certain status in which she gets having projects because people offer, because she has already a career. Uh, mm -hmm. So people offer the projects and, and she agree or not agree, but that it's not like, you know, when you are beginning a career that you do maybe whatever you find mm -hmm. or, or you... Mm -hmm. I know, trying to search for a different <laughs> project. I think that she yes. has now a profile in a way, and that probably determined a little bit the projects that she received. But mm -hmm. clearly, some of them are, I mean, her own romance doll that we were talking before is her own novel being adapted mm -hmm. by herself. Mm -hmm. So clearly, that is, that is something that she's interested in doing this type of stories. How some of the films are more um, or better received in uh, in Japan and abroad. I think that it has to be, is related a bit with the topic, but also, especially the, within Japan, with the production itself. Some production that she has done are very commercial, so they have very big stars in front of the camera. We have like mm -hmm. a romance, the, the round trip card, in which the protagonist is a AKB48 girl. So that clearly makes it more famous in Japan. Yes. And abroad, I think that she was very popular at the beginning of the 2000, at the end of the 2000, when she won the prize that we were mentioned at the beginning and one million and girl got release in got release got screen in many festivals in the West. And after mm -hmm. I feel that in the recent years, because maybe she has done more uh, films commercial in the terms of production, so they are backed by commercial televisions in Japan, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. have uh, idols on the screen, or they are based in manga, they are famous in Japan, but maybe they are not translated in the West, or mm -hmm. novels, they are, again, famous in Japan, and maybe they have received prizes, but no one in the West have uh, seen any, any of them because they haven't been translated. So those clearly are less, are perceived probably in the West as less interesting because the, if in Japan they are sell on the premises that the people know the manga, or people know the novel. But in, in the West, if those manga and novels, they don't have an audience, maybe they feel that they are not, they are not going to be understood or well received. Mm. I think that also film festivals programming Japanese cinema, uh, they have a moment in which they were, it still do sometimes kind of having the uh, women directors uh, season mm -hmm. here and there. But I feel that sometimes they stop at that. So they yes. do um, uh, the film season. No, oh, this year we are going to do a female uh, director uh, season and we are going to show some films. But after that, maybe they don't do it anymore it's not that they have to do it in they, they don't have to frame it in that way because they could still screen films by women without saying this is the mm -hmm. film or the female director section of the festival they could they could still do it but still i think that they struggle sometimes to i don't know pick up the films made by women because they are yeah. in the case of tanada i think the last the most recent films they are very tied to works that are famous in Japan and outside uh, Japan. 
I, I agree. I think that uh, festivals are fascinating the way that they pick up uh, certain films and not other films. And I do think that there's um, there becomes these moments where, you know, whoever's mm. running the festival or the director of the programming that year might have an interest in, in women directors. And so they get featured. But I don't think it's normalized in the, in the mm. sense yeah. where they just are always just part of a normal programming that that hasn't happened yet. It still seems like they're special topics. Um, yeah, even even this year. So in your article, uh, which is entitled an alternative representation of sexual difference in contemporary Japanese cinema made by women directors, you talk very much about um, the transgressive qualities of the characters and the transgressive potential of Tanada's film. So I'm wondering if you would speak a little bit, I'm hoping you will speak a little bit about this transgressive quality and maybe also we'll combine that with, you mentioned her depiction of male characters. So we've, we focused a lot on female characters, but also of male characters. So that article actually was one of my first articles when I was a master's student. So ah. yeah, I tried to be embarrassed about that, but uh, it's I, wonderful. I I, re- I was reading it again for for preparing for today, and I find that there are some things that are very naive, but I still I find there are some some interesting ideas there, and one of them I think that is this this way of presenting female sexual desire and female sexuality as something that is... I don't think that in some of them are presented as normal. For example, in Moon and Cherry, clearly, is, is, is make fun of it, is make mm-hmm. fun of this idea of, uh, of a woman being part of erotic club. And, but it, 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 it frames it in a way that, that relates to many other films we have seen of uh, sexual initiation, in which usually is young women being trained and being um, mm-hmm. picked by men and have a lot of fun of it, uh, making a reverse role and yes. making a woman train and 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 take the virginity of a man and, and teach him and etc. And other other films as well. I think that we have this idea of of uh, women being able to say what they want in terms of sex and and, and asking for sex and and, and being a, having a, an active position in that way mm-hmm. is tra- transgressive not only because it's the reverse role of of because it goes beyond the passivity of of women in in terms of representation but also how that is is represented in the story as something that uh, there is not only the story itself, but also the representation. It's also the filmmaking. It's also the way in which things are are presented to the audience. And you can, Mm -hmm. in that way, you can relate with many other films that are based on the same premises, but with different gender roles. Mm -hmm. And I think that Moon and Cherry is one of them. It's not only because she is the active role, but it's also because it's made in a comedy way. So it's not a serious, it's having fun of the idea of many other films in which young women were uh, discovered the pleasure of yeah. by men. So it's, it's making clear how, in a way, stupid that is. <laughs> yeah. like that. And because she doesn't do a, a serious film, right? She doesn't take it, the idea of this car- female character teaching sex to the male character. As, uh, so it doesn't take that idea just like 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 that and, in a serious way and you know yeah. like it, 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 it develops serious at the end let's say but in general is is make an, a kind of a fan of it that also again what you were saying about male characters it ties this different representation of women in sex or in sexual relationship with the idea of different representation of men in yes, sexual yeah. relationship. So they are, uh, the, fem- the male characters in general are a very different type of masculinity that you can see in, the, in, in many other films. And very few of them, in, most of them in, in some ways are, are very young, maybe are even younger than the, the women which, in which they are having sex. So they are in a way discovering sex, even when they are at the same age, like for example, in Ain't No Tomorrow, mm. they are men and women, high school students, you know, entering in the sex world. You can see them having the same doubts and the same fears and the same mm-hmm. uh, insecurities than female have. Uh, so they are not very secure or very powerful and strong female mm-hmm. uh, male characters. Mm-hmm. They are usually quite... I think that is, she's also very good in casting. And I think that uh, the cast of, of men actors are, are very good because all of them have a very... Um, 
not a strong present, physical present or, or caractereal present as men. Even when they, when we are talking about adult men, in the, in the recent years, she has done like Miss, my dad and Mr. Ito or Robert yes. Dog. No, yes. she has deal with that there or morning recipe that we haven't mentioned yet, but she has their male characters. They are adult male. They are not teenagers. They are not, um, but they are not the stereotypical masculinity of the salary man or the guy in a um, mainstream family. So they are, I don't know, Ito san, for example, mm-hmm. he's a part timer without <laughs> many ambition, but he's a very yeah. nice guy and he's yeah. perfect for her. So, and we have also the father. We have the, this, uh, the relationship with the, father daughter that appears in 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 the recent films in so she uh, is a father that is is aging mm-hmm. both of them no we mm-hmm. have an, an morning recipe that is a widow and in my dad and mr ito there is again a widow struggling with uh, living on his own and uh, and relying with the family with on a daughter that maybe is not uh, the how it's called the Diosa Ikembo. Yeah, the, the dutiful uh, daughter who wants the to take care daughter, of no? Neither not, one of them really want to take care of their father in these no, films, right? <laughs> they are not yeah. like that, but they yeah. no, you have this uh, vulnerability also in the father figure that you can yeah. see in the films. And and in the relationship of in Roman's doll, for example, you have as well the protagonist that is is designing sex dolls uh, as a as a job uh, mm-hmm. without telling her her wife for different reasons that I invite you to watch the movie and <laughs> yes uh, but he, he so even if he is uh, doing this job related with sex sexualization of women he doesn't seem to have a clue about the sexual life of her wife of his yeah. wife and 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 it seems much hopeless than her, even if, if her situation, as, as again, no spoiler, is much more difficult. He seems much more lost than her. And I yeah. think that in, in, in general, you can, it's difficult to find some characters, show male characters embody the like normalized heterosexual masculinity that you can find in, in, in Japanese society. I think that mm. she doesn't that if, if some, some of them appear, like for example, one million yen girl, there are some characters who are the kind of, you know... Um, stereotypical, are, you know, yeah, nice guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, but they are not depicted well, right? They, that is, doesn't, it's not that uh, where the protagonist meets or how, how they work. So they, they are portrayed negatively if they appear, and, but they are not definitely protagonists. They are quite dependent of we, on women, I will say. Yeah. So I, I like that you've brought to our attention that not only does Tanada behind the camera and writing her own scripts give us uh, new perspectives on genres that we are very familiar with in terms of female protagonists, but also she's giving us a different perspective on male characters as well, which is wonderful. (laughs) So I am wondering, I just have a couple more questions for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the other, um, her contemporaries, uh, both other women and maybe also uh, male directors that are, you know, working at the same age or in the same industry. And do you, you mentioned that she's part of this group of women um, that are pretty much all the same age that are having debuts at the same time. Do you see similarities with her contemporaries or is she really standing out as a, a unique figure? Hmm. I think that I mean <laughs> even if I if even if I frame them as because I think that you can see a generational and, and profile type female director and you can recognize that there is that, but I don't think that they are easily grouped. So it's very difficult. I don't think that it's not another on their own, but they have very different careers and they come from very different places. So I I can see that there is Tanada, maybe one of the things that she stand out as differently is maybe that she is quite integrated in, in commercial cinema and maybe other filmmakers have follow a different path. I, I'm thinking like, like Nina Gawamika that we were discussed before with Sakuran or Nishikawa mm. Miwa. They are, um, they, they do 
it's not that they don't do commercial cinema, but they are, they do, maybe they have done less projects, but more famous films. Mm-hmm. They have more, in the case of uh, Nishikawa, got prizes. She is very establishment cinema, and Tanada mm-hmm. is commercial cinema. Mm-hmm. The same her, she, maybe one of the reasons that we were talking before that she has not been, the last films of Tanada hasn't been, uh, haven't been um, much picked up in festivals or, or something. It's because they are very commercial in a way. So they are mm. focused on releasing in Japan and they don't usually get uh, Kinema Jumpo best right. fan or things right. like that. Instead, Nishikawa sometimes does. And she is more an author and is more part of the establishment for the, mm-hmm. for the critical point of view. And Tanada, I think that that... There were a moment in which a one million year girl, she combined these two things like commercial and prize award and authorship. But then mm-hmm. it seems that after that, I, but that's my, my feeling seeing the films that she has seen it. But it seems that after that moment, she depart a bit of the authorial cinema or the art mm-hmm. cinema and went mm-hmm. more through the commercial route. Then in a way, it's, it's very nice because you see kind of an integration and doing many different projects and with different producers and things like that. Many other women that started with her, or that around 2003, 2004, there is actually a big number of women releasing the first film. There was a kind of a, yes. a boom. A boom, yes. Years, <laughs> yeah. kind of, I mean, boom. If we compare with the number of films released in Japan, it was very tiny, but... Yes, it was we'll take what number. we can get, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we take what we can get, that's right. But uh, after some of them, like I'm thinking, for example, uh, in the article in which I was comparing Moon and Cherry with another film by Iguchi Nami. Iguchi Nami, yeah. Iguchi Nami seems to have struggled much more. She yeah. disappeared and I, I seen that she has done some recent film, but not much talk about it. Yeah. If, I don't know why. And other other filmmakers um, also struggle. We were, um, I was um, recently writing an article about female directors and we were asking them how, you know, some question about this idea of the labeling of female directors. And some of them actually, they said, I'm not working anymore because I, I, I've become a mother and uh-huh. uh, I have to stop. And it's not possible for me to combine this this type of job with uh, yes. maternity. So there has been, maybe when they started at the early 2000s, they were in, you know, late 20s, early 30s, but maybe if they become became mothers, maybe they have a halt in their careers there and then right. it's very complicated to come back. So I don't know if some of them, might, that might be the issue when we get lost in after this, the the... the they started in the early 2000s. It's true that it, we have a new generation of female filmmakers also working these days. I'm thinking, for example, Yoko Hamasatoko that is slightly yes. younger. But she has been doing very interesting things, or Mipo O as well. Yeah, I think that, I don't know, it's difficult. It's still, they are still very different careers. So it's difficult to for me to group together. And at the same time, it's difficult to stand out Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we have this sort of urge to group them together because it, it was it, there was a boom, there was this moment. So, you know, what facilitated that, and and um, do we have this generation, and is there something that we can identify as characteristics of this generation? But at the same time, we want to consider them on their own and independent directors because we don't often do that with male directors. Sometimes we yeah. do, right? Um, there's some modes of filmmaking that, that we do that, but yeah, we're sort of stuck um, between these two desires. And I think Tanada is a, a great director to consider in this sense because she is part of a group, but then she has also done her own thing quite differently than the other directors. And I also appreciate that you brought up these life challenges that women directors face as well, such as having children and having a family and then having to think about, um, you know, the social uh, responsibilities uh, that, that may not have networks of care or support for them to pursue professional careers at those points in their life. And I, I think Nishikawa Miwa has actually mentioned this as well. She doesn't like to talk about being a woman director at all, but recently she has said that because she doesn't have children, um, she's been able to continue on to make films. So I certainly, I think she's become aware that there is an, an aspect of gender 
for people who have not seen any of her films and mm. it's, she's completely new, where should they start? And, uh, you know, where, what do you recommend that they start with and where should they go from there? Oh, it's, uh, sometimes it's difficult because most of her films have not been released with English ah. titles. So that's a bit tricky. Uh, they are almost all, all of them in release in DVD in Japan. So if people are able to grab them, uh, through different sites or friends or whatever they can find the DVDs of them, but some of them, I would say most of them, we don't have uh, mm-hmm. English subtitles. So that um, thinking of that, I will say that maybe one of the things that I that it will be useful, even if it's not very known, um, is a recent TV series that she did that is called Tokyo Girls. Uh, We haven't talked about that, but it's a series uh, that she did with, uh, I think, the Fuji Television, if I'm correct. And um, it was actually an Amazon original. And it's Yes, yeah. Yeah. You can see in Amazon with English subtitles and other languages subtitles as well. Um, and that is quite interesting TV series I found. Based on a newspaper column, uh, she made, she followed one of one girl in a way, seen doing a similar thing to the city, uh, going from Fukuoka to Tokyo in the early 20s, uh, mm-hmm. when she was early 20s, and trying to to create a career and a life and uh, and uh, and I think that depicts very well it's, it's an easy way of understanding some of the issues the Japanese women have different ages in contemporary Japan it's very urban it's very Tokyo centric and it's, it's part of it's not it's not only talking about women it's also talking about class uh, in Tokyo uh, and combining that with gender um, mm-hmm. so in that sense it's it's quite interesting and it's also quite funny. It's very easy to watch <laughs> and it's, it's entertaining and, and it's easily available. So that will be a one recommendation, especially for young audiences that they, they watch in. And it's quite, it's, I think there's 10 episodes and, and easily available in Amazon. And if we have to think about films, I like I, Moon and Cherry, I think is still very funny. I rewatch it for this and I still think that it's very nice. It, it, it is it's more than 10 years now, 15 years almost. Uh, so, but it's still very fresh and very youngish and, and very kirky in a way. So I think that if you have the possibility of watching with subtitles, or without, and, and you know, I, I will also recommend it. More adult things, maybe uh, My Dad and Mr. Ito is a different take as well, and you can <laughs> see another aspect of contemporary Japan that is as an aging society and what that <laughs> implies in a kind of... We haven't touched about uh, humor in, in Tanada. No. I forgot to tell that about uh, when, when you were asking me about feature or, or characteristics that you, you can find in, his, in her work, but I think the humor, she's... She always is. Uh, there are some of some films like like uh, Hatsuko's War, one of her early films, that are very serious. And, but in general, in most of the others, you have always humoristic and, and kind of uh, even in kind of a bit black humor things that are without being comedy. They are humor and, and humoristic comical situations mm. in their films. Uh, oh, Miss, my dad and Mister Ito, I think that is as an adult. Um, setting in which the, the protagonists are, are not teenager or, or young people uh, is also interesting to watch. I mean, there's some very serious undertones to my dad and Mr. Ito, especially when they, they go to the, the countryside to see the family estate, the family house and what happened mm-hmm. has happened there. So it is dealing with this very heavy topic in Japan right now, which is aging society and mm-hmm. caregiving and things falling apart. But the rest of the film it has these quirky... <laughs> These quirky characters that lift us out of that, um, so that's not quite so heavy. So mm. she, yeah, you know, even she, she does have a, a nice way of balancing quite heavy topics with um, a, a lightness that that we can approach um, through humor, even if it's black humor. Yeah, if it's dark humor. Mm. Well, Alejandra, thank you so much for speaking with mm. me um, and for your work. Thank and you. <laughs> I look forward to reading more of your work when it's when it's done and when it comes out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.